Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India We have so far seen six lectures, the first three on the relevance of poetry, the approaches to poetry and the functions of poetry are closely related to Simon Sinek's golden circle with three questions, why, how, what. The underlying assumption is if we understand our own beliefs, it will be good for us, then our belief system will tell us how to do things and what to know about life and what to know about what we are doing. The next three lectures, the forms of poetry, poetic devices and the music of poetry are related to the ways in which we approach poetry. Now, we begin with the spring of poetry from Geoffrey Chaucer in English literature. He is considered to be the fountain of English poetry for Spencer, Milton, Wordsworth and many others that is a tradition of English poetry. Geoffrey Chaucer was born in the 14th century, the exact year in which he was born is not very clear to us. So, we have fixed it something like 1343 and he died in 1400. We look at the historical and literary context first and then raise a question why is he called the father of English poetry. To answer this question, we examine Chaucer's achievements and one of his finest achievements is to create a place called the Poets Corner and that has become a location for all poets to aspire for in Britain. Then we see the three phases in the writings of Chaucer. We also go to the influence or the origin of the Canterbury Tales in Boccaccio's Tecamaran. We see the prologue the three estates that Chaucer describes in the prologue. We list the characters we find in the prologue and also we touch on the arrival of the pilgrims in this presentation. Let us examine the historical context in which Chaucer lived and wrote his poetry. The political and social conditions of 14th century are marked by the reigns of Edward III, Richard II and Henry IV. In this period, we have the origin of this 100 years war between England and France starting from 1337 to 1453 that is going into the next century. The war was fought for 116 years, but it is generally known as 100 years war. In this war, Chaucer participated. He was also taken a prisoner once and released on ransom. Another major event of this century is the Black Death. It came to England in 1348 and 49 due to a specific bacteria called Yersinia pestis. It affected a large number of people. It recurred again in 1361 and 62. We are lucky that Chaucer escaped the 100 years war and also the black death. In this time also we find shortage of labor in the agricultural field and also for the military. As a result, we find large number of peasants being exploited by the gentry, the land owning class and the result of this exploitation was 
the peasants revolt in 1381. And these changes plus the rise of the merchant class in this historical time shaped the poetry of Geoffrey Chaucer. When we come to the literary context, we see that foreign languages and literatures were dominant in England. French was commonly used in the court and Latin was used in the church. However, there was a latent desire in the people and also in the administration for a native pride in using English in their own communication. In this period, we find two major forms of literature called dream vision and allegory. Both of them are intermingled in some way. These dream visions and allegories were satires against corruption in the church and also in the court. We have two major examples of this satire, William Langland's Pierce Plowman and John Gower's Confessio Amentis. The, though the title is Latin, John Gower wrote his poem in English. Next we have Charles's own Canterbury Tales. It was at this time we find a major effort to translate the Bible into English. That effort was carried out by John Wycliffe. Now, we come to the question of why is Chaucer called the father of English poetry? We also have so many other questions. What did Chaucer do to earn this title? Can writing poetry in English alone gain a poet this title? Of course, there were many other anonymous old English poems in this period. There were other middle English poets like William Langland and John Gower who wrote poems in, in English. They were the contemporaries of Geoffrey Chaucer. In fact, it is surprising to see that John Gower received a more respectable burial when he died than Chaucer. Now, the question remains why Chaucer? We will see some answers now. Chaucer's achievements in poetry are remarkable. These are the various points which support our argument. He began telling a story within a story. He used the common Saxon language, not French, not Italian in this Canterbury Tales. He took the chance to regularize iambic pentameter. This regularization happened with the consistent use of 10 syllables in a poetic line. And also he started practicing n rhymes. In addition to all this, he was a master of using irony and satire. His irony and satire are known by his skill for gentleness, humaneness. He also portrayed characters realistically. You will see that the character you find in the Canterbury Tales are something like our neighbors. Another point we have to notice in his poem is the casual interaction with listeners or readers. One more thing that we have to observe in the Canterbury Tales, particularly in this prologue is cataloging of characters, listing of characters. This is a technique called blazon. And for all these things, he is considered to be the first notable English poet deserving the title, the father of English poetry. A cultural aspect of Chaucer's writing is this, this is a heritage that Chaucer has left England with. There is a place called the Poets Corner in England. This is a place of tourist attraction today. This is a section of the famous Westminster Abbey. It was here William the Conqueror who conquered England in 1066 was crowned as the King of England. Thereafter, the coronations of all kings and queens usually have taken place in this 
church. Chaucer happened to be buried in this place. If you ask why was he buried here, you will find some surprising answer. He happened to live his last days in near this church within the precincts of this church. Why so? There is another reason. It seems that he had borrowed money from a number of creditors for some reason. They were pursuing him all the time. To escape from them, he came and settled here. Anyone who lives within the campus of this church would not be disturbed. And when he died, he was buried within the church compound. After 150 years or so, a monument was raised for Chaucer in this place. From then on, the place is known as the Poets Corner. We notice three distinct phases in the writings of Chaucer. The first one is called French period with three books, the Book of the Duchess, the Parliament of Birds, the House of Fame. The second period called Italian period has two literary writings, Troilus and Cressid and Legend of Good Women. These two are known for their famous love poetry. Troil, if Troilus and Cressid deal with the betrayal of love by your lady, legend of good women support good women actually. Then we come to the last period that is the English period in Charles's uh, life. Here we have this celebrated the Canterbury Tales. In this poem, Chaucer used the common English language used by people. He also used rhymed iambic pentameter and you have the rhymed, cu rhymed couplets at the end of every two lines in the Canterbury Tales. In this poem, we have the realistic portrayal of all classes of people. Most importantly, we find a sense of fellowship with the author and other characters through the gentle use of irony and humor. The model for Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales is in the Italian writing called Decameron by Boccaccio. This was probably written in 1351. This is a collection of 100 tales using the story within a story framework. In 1348, there was a plague in Florentine town. Those who wanted to escape this plague went to some other place. In this story, we have seven young women and three young men staying in a villa near the town, away from the town for 10 days to escape the plague. To spend their time, they were telling 10 tales a day making up 100 tales for their own entertainment. In his own lifetime, Chaucer visited Italy twice, once in 1372 and another in 1378. Perhaps he met Boccaccio also, we have no evidence, concrete evidence actually. He found Boccaccio was very popular in his country, probably he got this motivation to write the Canterbury Tales from Boccaccio. He took this as a model and chose the medium of English for writing his tales in poetry. The Canterbury Tales deals with a group of pilgrims from different parts of the country. Chaucer mentions 29 pilgrims in line 24 in the prologue, but we have some controversy about the number of pilgrims in the Canterbury Tales. The pilgrims met here to go on their pilgrimage to St. Thomas Beckett shrine at Canterbury. They are all assembled here at a particular location called the Tabard Inn. The narrator started interacting with all these people and came to learn about their interest in life and their interest in telling stories as well. The man who plans his idea of telling tales by these pilgrims is Harry Bailey, 
the innkeeper of the Tabard Inn. He plays the role of the host, the guide, the governor, the judge for all these pilgrims. According to the plan, each pilgrim had to tell two tales on the way to the shrine and two tales on their return. On the whole, it was planned to have 120 tales, but then what we have now is just 24 tales. Of these 24, two are not yet fully completed. All these tales have the prologue. This prologue describes all these pilgrims. In our text, we cannot use the original Chaucer's English text, we may not be able to understand English though it is called English, Middle English is not easily readable for us, we have to train ourselves to read Middle English. So, we are using Neville Coggill's translation of Chaucer. In Neville Coggill's translation, we have 856 lines in the prologue. In the first 42 lines, we have the general context and the idea of the pilgrimage. In the next section from 43 to 735, we have all these characters being described. They belong to all classes of people. We have courtiers, clergy, professionals, tradesmen, common people, men and women, young and old, urban and rural, we have all kinds of people. Then in the next part from 735 to 736, we have the narrator's own comments about his own storytelling. And in the last section from 767 to 856, we have the host and he tells us about the planning of storytelling. He also thinks about one idea of free meal for the best story, for the person who tells the best story. In this prologue and in the whole of this uh, Canterbury Tales, we have this concept called three estates. Actually, there is a form of literature called estate satire. Uh, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales can easily be classed along with this estate satire because of the element of satire we have in the Canterbury Tales. What are those three estates? One is the military, the second is the church and the third is the laborer or labor class, working class. All these characters are divided generally into two categories, gentles and commoners. Within the gentles, we have three classes of people. First, aristocrats, the knight, the square and the yeoman. The second category, the prioress, the monk, the friar, the second nun and the priest, all belonging to clergy. And the third category, the merchant, clerk, sergeant of law, Franklin belonging to higher level of this landed class people. And then in the second class of commoners, we have three groups, the five guildsmen, the cook, the shipman, the physician and the wife of bath all belong to one group. They have something to do with the professionals. And the second one belongs to clergy, the parson and the rural person that is the farm farmer called the plowman. And in the third category, we have a distinct class of people who are marked for their absence of character, integrity and many other good qualities of being human. The miller, the reeve, the manciple, the summoner and the partner. So, we have different kinds of people broadly divided into two groups, the gentles and the commoners and within this we have three levels of people based on their social class and also based on their moral quality. These are the characters we have in the prologue, just let me read them one after another. You will see that there are 32 characters mentioned within the prologue. The knight, the square, the yeoman, one group the nun, the second nun, the nun's three priests, 
the monk, the friar, the merchant, the Oxford clerk, the sergeant at law, the Franklin, another group, the guildsman, the cook, the skipper, the doctor, the wife of Bath, yet another group, the parson, the ploughman, the miller, the mansiple, the reeve, the partner, the summoner, yet another group. The narrator is a class by himself, similarly the host is a separate character by himself. Now, we move on to the poem actually, the arrival of the pilgrims. We have this arrival in the first 18 lines. As we said earlier, we are using the translation of Neville Cogill. Let us begin. When in April the sweet showers fall and pierce the drought of March to the root and all, the veins are bathed in liquor of such power as brings about the engendering of the flower. When also Zebris with his sweet breath exhales an air in every grove and heath upon the tender shoots and the young sun his half course in the sign of the ram has run and the small fowl making melody that sleep away the night with open eye, so nature pricks them and their heart engages, then people long to go on pilgrimages and farmers long to seek the stranger sands, the stranger stands of far off saints hallowed in sundry lands and specially from every shire's end of England down to Canterbury they went to seek the holy blissful martyr quick to give his help to them when they were sick. These are the pilgrims, they have arrived at the Tabardin in the spring season when everything is fine, they are the, that when there is a renewal of life, the pilgrims themselves want to have a renewed life by visiting Canterbury by seeking the blessing of Thomas Beckett to show their gratitude to this martyr, blissful martyr. So, that is the beginning of this prologue. In this presentation so far, we have seen the historical and literary context of Chaucer's times. We discussed why Chaucer is father of English poetry by focusing on the achievements of Chaucer and also mentioning the poet's corner. We mentioned the three phases of Chaucer's writings and finally focused on the English period in which Chaucer wrote the Canterbury Tales using Boccaccio's Tecamaran as a model. We started discussing the prologue, particularly we mentioned about the three estates to which the characters belong. Then finally, we looked at the arrival of the pilgrims, we have received them. Now, let us see the descriptions of these pilgrims, at least some of them in the next presentation. We have some references for you, if possible please do read. In this case, we have a research journal called Chaucer Review. It is wonderful to read at least one article from this journal to understand more about Chaucer and his Canterbury tales. Thank you.